Well, thank you for joining us for another uh, edition of our training on the Christian mindset in a culture of chaos. We're on uh, number three in our series of trainings on this on this very important subject today. As Christians, we must know how to think about this world and think about our place in this world and to be able to understand God's narrative about this world from the beginning of time all the way down to now because we tend to isolate uh, the events that we're experiencing in our lives and sometimes we isolate those events from a larger context and when we do so we lose perspective on what's going on. The Christian mindset and this whole series of training that we're trying to do is designed to do a couple of things. One is is to is to uh, to set up the framework of this uh, narrative of God and um, at least give you some some ways of, of uh, thinking about the narrative of God over the course of the history of the world but to secondly to give you vocabulary and give you a way to talk to other people about what's going on and so there's going to be various themes that we're going to be using uh, in order to get that across. One of those themes that we have talked about, and, and you'll, be, you'll see this surface several times in, the, in this series, is the theme of Eden. Is when God created the world, he placed man in a garden of Eden. And it was a perfect place, it was a perfect environment, and it was a place where uh, man could experience a not only a perfect relationship with God but a perfect relationship with with everyone in the garden unfortunately it didn't last very long because man made a decision to disobey God and he separated himself from that garden and man has been trying to get back to the garden ever since so today we're going to talk about what happened um, in the critical area of man's life, of, of Adam and Eve's life, and in our lives, what happens in our hearts. And I'm going to read to you the things that I've written to you. Uh, those will be eventually made available to you so you can reread them and have them for yourselves. Um, and then we'll go into some discussion of these matters for the next several minutes. And so reading from this uh, is called The Heart. The heart. Man's heart corresponds to Eden. It takes a certain kind of heart to live in Eden. Unfortunately, man lost his heart when he sinned. It's infected with a virus that causes it not to work well, creating a lot of disorder. Jesus said, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts and murder and adultery and sexual immorality and theft and false testimony and slander. Um, and these are what make a man unclean. Matthew chapter 5, 19 through 20. It was man's heart that was only evil continually that led to the flood and the grieving of God's heart, according to Genesis 6, 5 and 6. Two hearts out of sync with one another. The chaos of Egypt was because of man's hard heart that led to the enslavement of millions of Jews over 400 years uh, in that land. It took an extreme act of God to break those chains. God was determined to take back man's heart during the days of Moses, according to Deuteronomy 6, 5 and 6. It proved to be a very difficult task, even for God, who gave man free will. In Jeremiah's day, God declared, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. Paul called the heart foolish and darkened and stubborn 
and unrepentant, according to Romans chapter 1, 21, and chapter 2 and verse 5. The heart of man is the heart of the matter. Since leaving Eden, man has been searching for his heart. While trying to re recreate Eden, man is proving century after century what Jeremiah learned 26 centuries ago. I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It's not for man to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10, verse 23. A man cannot fix his own heart, nor the heart of his neighbor. That is why the gardens that we create never live up to our ideals. We are planting gardens only to learn that we don't have the right kind of hearts to make them an Eden. God must deal with our hearts. We are people who who desperately want to have peace and security in this world. Much of the chaos and the confusion that we see in our world today is about people whose hearts have been stirred up because of one event or another that causes them to say, we want justice, we want fairness, we want peace. The problem with is not with our desiring those things. The problem is, is that our hearts have to be pure in the pursuit of those things. And if the heart is not pure, if the heart is not good, then we will never realize those things in any degree in this world. And we might even miss it in the next world. I want to, over the next few minutes for us to explore this and unpack this a little bit so that we can understand that when we're talking to people, and we're trying to help them to understand how to deal with the political scene today that is filled with chaos, when we, when we see the, the social fabric of our country being ripped apart because of, uh, because of riots and protests and people having various agendas of, of trying to affect change within our society, when we see it even in our churches where people are often at war with one another, that we have to realize that the issue is not just out there, it's not just in the events, and it's certainly not in many of the methods that we use to try to change things, but the secret of, of the whole matter is what is going on in our heart. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. I've got two or three things that I want to say about that today. And the first is, I want us to go to another scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I want to read verses 1 through 3. And in this passage, I want you to see where the heart fits into this matter. Now again, contextually, contextually, there are some people who have gotten into the church at Corinth, and they are trying to lead people astray. They are not just leading them away from Paul because Paul was the apostle who helped establish that congregation, and he is the one who nurtured that congregation over a long period of time. And there are some people who have come in behind him who are not being very gracious to Paul and about his work there, and they're trying to lead people away. But in the process, they're also leading them away from Jesus. They're leading them away from the message that Paul preached about Jesus. And Paul is very concerned about them because there's something that is happening in the hearts of these people. At one time, their heart was very devoted to Jesus and very devoted to Paul and his ministry. But these people are being led astray. And so listen to what Paul says um, to them in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Paul says, I hope that you will put up with a little of my foolishness, but you are already doing that. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ so that you might pre so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid 
that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. There was a fear that Paul had about what was going on in the lives of these Christians, and it was not just circumstantial fear. It wasn't just that you know, they, they were going to go to another church or they were going to, um, you know, stop supporting the ministry with their finances or other such things. Those weren't the primary fears that Paul had. Paul feared what was going on in the hearts of these people. And so he addresses them and he says, I'm afraid for your hearts. Now he uses the word mind here, but when you see the word mind, there is not a big difference between the word mind and the word heart. I'm not going to go into the distinctions here and the way the Greeks looked at it and the way the Jews looked at it and all of that. But simply to say, you can, you can just about uh, do a one for one. That when you see the word mind, you can think heart. And when you see the word heart, you can think mind. Because they overlap almost exclusively in the language of Scripture. And so he says, I am, I am afraid that uh, someone has deceived you and your minds are somehow led astray. You, and it's interesting, in this verse, he goes back to the garden. He goes back to Eve, and he says, Eve was deceived. There was deception. That is what happens in our hearts. When our hearts are led astray, it is because there is a deception. There is something that gets mixed into our heart. There's a lie that is told. That's exactly what Satan did in the garden to deceive Eve. He told her a lie. He told her that when you eat this fruit, you will be as wise as God and you will not die. That was a lie. And she listened to that because it sounded good. It sounded enticing. I mean, who wants to die? And who would, wouldn't want to be as wise as God? And so he made it very appealing to her, but it was a deception. He told her something that directly contradicted what God had said to her about not eating of the fruit of that tree. And in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And so I want you to think about the mind part here, that your mind is very, very important. Your heart is very important. And that you have to make sure that you're not being deceived by things that Things aren't being planted in your heart that will lead you astray. And then he talks about lead, being led astray. And I was thinking about what are, the, what are the kinds of things that lead us astray? Well, superficially, I mean, I, I didn't do a big study of this, uh, but just from my experience in studying the scriptures, there's three basic things that I believe that can lead us astray. One of them is evil desires that occur in our own heart. We want something that we shouldn't have. It's an evil desire, and it turns into sin, and that can turn into death. Secondly, we can, be, we can be led astray by what I would call alternative solutions to a problem, or alternative cures to a problem. You know, when you're deceived, and somebody says, if you do this, this is going to solve your problem. Or if you, if you take this, then this is going to solve your problem. Or if you follow this path, this is going to, this is going to solve your problem. When we are deceived in that way, when we, when we fall for that, and we, when, we think, when we seek alternative solutions uh, from the solutions that God has given to our problems, then we are led astray. And then the third way that I believe that we are typically led astray is by just the distractions of this world. I mean, there are things that just happen in our lives on a daily basis. It can be mundane things about the car breaking down, or illnesses that we may get, or, you know, it can be anything that just dominates our attention and causes us to be so distracted, even by good things in this world, so distracted that we miss the important things of the world. And so we can be led astray by evil desires, by alternative solutions, and by by distractions in this world. But what are we being led away from? Well, in the text he says, 
that he feared that they were going to be led away from their sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He compares this to uh, wanting to present these people as a pure virgin to Christ. Paul saw himself as kind of a matchmaker. He was one who was going out and finding people who could be married to Jesus, who could become a part of his church, the bride of Christ. And he would say to them, you need to have a pure and sincere devotion to Christ. Don't let anything get in the way of that. Don't let anything uh, distract you from that. Don't let any other evil, or don't let any evil desire get in your heart that's going to lead you away from that. And so what must be preserved at all cost is our sincere and pure devotion to Christ. But let me talk about this for a minute. I believe in the world in which we live, in this chaos in which we live, that we are being baited all the time that Satan has found ways to dangle bait in front of us and we are too often taking the bait now what is a bait bait is something that is often artificial it's not even real you can put a plastic worm uh, on your on your rod and reel and you can th on your line and you can throw that out there and a big old bass will think that that's a real worm and they'll take the bait the bait is also sometimes even if it's a, a real worm or even if it's a minnow or if it's something that's alive it's only a temporary meal it's never meant to be something you're feeding that fish with forever is a temporary meal. The bait that Satan offers is either artificial or is temporary. And either way, it's not going to satisfy you. And either way, there is a hook in it. And I fear that we are often in our world today taking the bait and allowing ourselves to get hooked into conversations that we don't need to even be having, hooked into a way of talking in those conversations that we don't even need to be talking that way, we take the bait and then Satan is sitting there just kind of reeling us in closer and closer and further away from God. So there is a hook and that hook is going to snag the heart and it's going to tear the heart and it's going to do damage to the heart. We must be careful not to take the bait. You know, the heart longs for significance. It longs for purpose. And so if someone comes along and they promise that through some earthly movement or cause, that we are that that we if we get involved with this or we get involved with that that somehow through that earthly cause or that earthly movement that we're somehow going to find our ultimate fulfillment and blessing in that you just know that's bait it's artificial it's a temporary meal it is not going to give you an eternal satisfaction and so we need to be careful about what these things are. Now, I want to give you a disclaimer. I'm going to mention some things here. And I want, you, I want to be clear about this. These are not bad things. I understand we could, we could, Satan can dangle some really evil things out there and we can try to find significance and purpose in things that are just absolutely evil. You know, and it may be uh, a, a substance abuse or pornography or other things that that Satan will dangle out there in front of us that can consume our lives and can cause us to to think we can have some fulfillment in those things those are artificial they're temporary they do not satisfy but there are also a lot of good causes 
and good things that we can become so focused on that we don't even see the hook in them. Um, I'm going to mention some, and again, like I say, they're not necessarily bad in and of themselves. They may be noble. They may be good. They just may not be primary. So what is some causes? Well, we have a tendency to want to save something. We want to save the, the planet. We want to save the earth. We want to save the whales. We want to save the forest. We want to save lives, even. We want to save a way of life, maybe, that we are wanting to preserve. You know, if you grew up in the country and, and you had a simple kind of life that never did me no harm, you know, raising me a family and working on the farm, you may want to preserve that way of life. And so you may do everything to create around you that kind of environment. Again, nothing wrong with that. You know, it's, it's, it's a good life. But sometimes we become so focused on that that we, we think our fulfillment and our reason for existence is to preserve that way of life. Or it can be, uh, it can be uh, devoting ourselves to people or to hobbies or other things that would dominate our time and attention to such a degree that Satan says, if I can get you focused on those things, then I will take you away from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now again, I'm not saying those things are evil, they're not bad, they're good, and God bless you if you are involved in, in those kinds of things. And what I'm saying here is, is, is that they're not the primary focus of our lives. All of these things may be good in and of themselves, but they are not the main thing. You know, Paul is arguing here is that your heart has to be absolutely, totally, 100% focused on a sincere and pure devotion to Jesus. And what that means is, is listening to Jesus. He's got to be the strongest, the loudest voice in your head every day. He must be the one who is directing your steps. He is the one who has the reins of your heart. He is the one who is showing you how to keep your heart, how to preserve your heart. Because if your heart is led astray in any way, then you are not going to find Eden. You're not even going to know how to live in Eden unless you have that pure and that, and that sincere, devoted heart to God. You know, there's a devotional book that is my favorite devotional book of all time. It's called The Ransomed Heart. And it's a collection of writings from a man named John Eldridge. Uh, probably his most famous book was one called um, Wild at Heart for Men. But uh, this devotional book is one that I really, really like uh, and have used over the years and have shared with uh, many other people. Um, and I, he talks a lot about the heart uh, in this devotional. And so I'm going to conclude uh, pretty much by reading a couple of excerpts from uh, John Eldridge's book. And uh, I think you'll see how pertinent what he has to say is. Um, the heart is central. That I would even need to remind you of this only shows how far we have fallen from the life that we were meant to live, or how powerful the spell has been. The subject of the heart is addressed in the Bible more than any other topic, more than works or serve, more than believe or obey, more than money, and even more than worship. Maybe God knows something we've forgotten, but of course, all those other things are matters of the heart. Consider but a few passages. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6, 5. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. Where your treasure is, 
There your heart will be also. Luke chapter 12 and verse 34. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3 and verse 5. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Psalm 119 and verse 11. These people honor me with, my, with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Matthew 15 and verse 8. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. According to the scriptures, the heart can be troubled. It can be wounded and pierced and grieved and even broken. How well we all know that. Tr thankfully, it can also be cheerful and glad and merry and joyful and rejoicing. The heart can be whole or divided. As in, the fr as in that phrase we often use, well, part of me wants to, but the other part of me doesn't. It can be wise or foolish. It can be steadfast, true, upright, stout, valiant. All of these descriptions can be found by pursing the, the uh, listings for the word heart in any concordance. Um, a perusing, that is. It can also be frightened, faint, cowardly. It can melt like wax. The heart can be wandering and forgetful and dull and stubborn and proud and hardened, wicked and perverse. I think we know that as well. Much to our surprise, according to Jesus, a heart can also be pure. As in, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Matthew 5 and verse 8. And even noble in the story about the sower. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. Luke 8 and verse 15. The Bible sees the heart as the source of all creativity and courage and conviction. It is the source of our faith, our hope, and of course our love. It is the wellspring of life within us, Proverbs 4 and verse 23. The very essence of our existence, the center of our being, the fount of our life. There is no escaping the centrality of the heart. God knows that. That's why he made it central, the central theme of the Bible, just as he placed the physical heart in the center of the human body. The heart is central. To find our lives, we must make it central again. And I would add, to find Eden, we must make the heart central again. If we're going to have a Christian mindset in a culture of chaos, then we're going to have to learn how to speak to people's hearts. We cannot just simply speak to their heads. We can't just simply speak to their loud voices. We have to find a way to speak to the heart. One heart to another. One longing to another. Because essentially, God has made us and designed us to all want some of the same things. We want Eden. And maybe if we can talk to people about that longing that is in their heart to see a world where there's peace and equity and love and justice and mercy and kindness and goodness that every heart, I believe, down deep inside want then maybe we can have the right kind of conversations that will cause us to be a part of the solution in the chaos and not part of the chaos itself. I want you to consider deeply to take some inventory of your own heart. Particularly in this time when we do live in chaos, what is the chaos doing to your heart? How is it changing you? How is it affecting you in your heart? And is it something where you need to go and ask God to recreate a clean heart in you so that that heart will be 
pure and sincere in your devotion to Christ. The heart is the heart of the matter when it comes to the Christian mindset. We must regain our heart. I just want to encourage you with everything within me is if you have never given your heart completely and totally and unreservedly to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, please, please do that. Give Him your heart. Give Him the central part of your being. And all the rest will follow. You will follow where your heart goes. And so if you've never done that, I pray that you will do that. And if you want to learn more about how to do that and how we can help you to do that, please give us a call. Please email us. Go to our website, centralsarasota.org, and, and contact us and reach out to us. And let us help you to understand how you can get your heart back. The heart that God gave you that was designed to live in the Garden of Eden. And if you are a Christian already and you gave your heart to God, but yet you've taken the bait and you've allowed yourself to get wrapped up in, in some things that either are just out and out wrong and evil, or you just wrapped up in distractions or causes that do not fulfill, then I pray that you'll go back to Christ and let Him cleanse you again and recreate in you a clean heart. So thank you for joining us for this message today. Um, I pray that you will um, also check out other things that we have on our website, centralsarasota.org. Uh, you'll find uh, messages from our Sunday sermons. You'll find um, a training there called a faith challenge. You'll find other messages that you will have links to. Uh, uh, teaching on the mind of Christ and other things that can be helpful in your walk with Christ. And so thank you for joining us uh, in this study and in this training tonight. God bless you. Bye-bye.